Hi, I'm Dino Dave Wetzel with the organization Genesis Park. And I'd love to visit with you for a few minutes on the topic of is creationism a fundamental? Now some might be tempted to push back against that word fundamental. Fundamentalists are oftentimes associated with uh, cultists or perhaps even Muslim extremists that would be terrorists. Uh, I liked fundamental in the old fashioned sense that there are certain fundamentals of historic Christianity that are central to the gospel that if we lose, we will no longer have orthodox Christianity. And so fundamentals are those core doctrines that are so essential that they are not interpretations or preferences, but they actually make up core Christianity. And if they're lost, we will no longer recognize Christianity as we have known it, orthodox, biblical, God's truth as revealed to us in the scriptures. Others today are put off by fundamentals as perhaps some things that people have interpreted or preferences that they've made into fundamentals, social things. If you don't wear a tie on Sunday to church, then you're not a fundamentalist. If you don't listen to a style of music that's from some particular uh, time period, then maybe you're not a fundamentalist. And so folks will push back against this idea of fundamentalist and they'll say, well, I'd prefer to be known as a conservative evangelical uh, or maybe some other term. But I want to talk about this idea of fundamentals in the old fashioned sense. Is historic Christianity really thinking and holding to creationism as a core non-negotiable? Something that you're willing to take a stand on, something you're willing to separate from people that are going apostate, they're leaving historic Christianity uh, in a particular area, in a particular teaching. Here you see on my screen a little bit of something humorous. This is a professor who's assigned his college student a mathematics problem. And of course, he starts off with a problem and he kind of knows where he has to end up as an answer. But then in the middle, he puts this phrase, then a miracle occurs. And of course, the professor is a little bit skeptical of that and says, I think you need to be a bit more explicit here in step two. Now, I have a master's degree in biology, and I understand that we as scientists don't want to hear, well, a miracle occur. We want to have something that we can figure out naturally and, and hopefully be able to use to our benefit in the world of science. But there are times when we understand by revelation that God has done a miracle. God has done something supernatural. And for us to reject God's revealed truth and to look for an alternative ex explanation to this isn't a matter of some kind of uh, scientific honor. Rather, it is intellectually dishonorable because it is casting doubt on the very character of God. And so while it might not be a useful scientific tool for investigating the natural world, if God does indeed do something miraculous, we need to glorify him for his work and believe what he says in the scriptures. So that's kind of a little bit of a foretaste of where I want to go in this particular session discussing, is creation a fundamental? I want to do three things. Number one, I want to talk about the original fundamentals. That is the fundamentals that were put together in the time frame of World War I that was in response to the skepticism, the higher criticism, the rationalism, especially some of the thinking that came out of Germany, the philosophy that said, really science and scientific thought should supersede the scriptures. And we have to reject all the miracles and we have to reject the idea of mosaic authorship of Genesis. And really we're going to be the critics of the Bible rather than letting the Bible be a critic of us. And so that was what the original fundamentals was, was a response to this liberalism, this modernism that was coming into evangelical Christianity and really causing churches to go apostate and lose the historic Christian faith and the power of the gospel. Number two, popular interpretations of Genesis chapters one and two. I just wanna go through some of these theories. You may have heard some of these theories. What about the gap theory? What about the day age theory? We'll talk about some of those. And then number three, I just wanna briefly talk about if creation's a fundamental, what are the key essential tenets? What do we mean by saying uh, that creationism is a fundamental? And so those are the three points I want to talk about in this session.
Now, when we look at the papers, this about 90 papers that were put together in response to modernism and the religious liberalism, the skepticism of the late 1800s, uh, evolution and some of the communist thinking and some of the socialistic thinking and even the psychology of Freud and some of the stuff that was coming into uh, the philosophy of the day. These papers, four of them, incorporated into the historic volume, The Fundamentals, directly deal with Genesis and the origins controversy. So I want to just briefly summarize those four papers. The first is a paper written by James Orr entitled The Early Narratives of Genesis. And James Orr says, and I quote here, the creation of the world was certainly not a myth, but a fact. And the representation of the stages of creation dealt likewise with facts. In these narratives in Genesis and the facts which they embody are really laid the foundation of all else in the Bible. Now it sounds an awful lot like James Orr is saying creation and the belief in creation and God's work, literally Genesis chapter one and two, is a fundamental of faith. He's calling it a foundation of all else that's in the Bible. And really, if you take the time to study Genesis 1 and 2, you'll see that that's exactly what it is. You want to find out about sin. Well, sin is pretty important to the gospel and why we need a Savior, right? You want to find out about sin. Where do you go? Well, we would go to the law, but before that, we would go to Genesis chapter 3, when sin is, enters into this world. And we see the first sin, and we see God's response to sin, the trespassing, the violating of his command. And we see that man has a response. Man tries by his works to cover up his sin with fig leaves. And God rejects man's approach, and God has an alternative approach. And God brings a substitute, a sacrifice, and blood is shed. And these are so important. These are fundamental. These are core doctrines that then get developed throughout the rest of the Bible. Uh, everything from the gospel, the proto-evangelicum, this idea of the seed of the woman coming to crush the head of the serpent, this wicked intruder in the garden that seduces man into disobedience to God. We see gender roles, we see marriage, we see sexuality, we see all these basic fundamental things the family. Uh, these are laid out in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3. And so it truly is foundational to the Bible. The second paper is one entitled The Passing of Evolution by George Frederick Wright. Now, George Frederick Wright uses this uh, kind of very flowery language, uh, but I think you can follow him here. He says, evolution is not a new thing in philosophy, and such is the frailty of human nature that it's not likely to disappear suddenly from among men. The craze of the last half century is little more than a recrudescence of a philosophy which has divided the opinions of men from the earliest ages. Now that recrudescence simply means it's a kind of a rebirth of something that's been around for a long, long time. And indeed evolution has in one form or the other. It comes from pagan roots, this idea that uh, there was this chain of, of being and you have one thing changing and morphing into another kind of being. And of course naturalism, this idea that uh, we don't need God, we can have nature explain all the phenomenon, the origins and everything that's going on. That's nothing new. Uh, Charles Darwin is just the latest iteration of that. And so uh, this is a recognition of that by George Frederick Wright. The third paper is anonymous. Perhaps it's anonymous because it deals very bluntly with those that have accepted evolutionism into the pulpit. And that's the title of it. And it uses some pretty strong words. He says, the clergymen who accepted the evolutionary theory were driven to it by fear of ridicule or of not being thought abreast of the trend of modern thought. It was not only cowardly on their part, but grossly inconsistent with their Christian profession. These men ought to drop their materialism or leave the Christian pulpit. Now those are strong words, but they're correct, they're accurate. Really it was the peer pressure that drove this thinking uh, of taking science and taking it and putting it in a place of authority over God's word. And uh, these uh, Christians are called out for being cowardly, inconsistent uh, with their Christian profession and, and this materialism that is brought in the pulpit is condemned. Again, I think it's pretty clear that they would say evolution 
is a departure from historic Christianity. The fourth paper is one called The Decadence of Darwinism. And Henry Beach approaches this not so much from a scientific refutation of Darwinism uh, or even a biblical one, but more a philosophical one and kind of uses a lot of rhetoric. In some cases, he gets a bit humorous. I want to give you one of those examples. Quote, an embryonic reptile passes through the transformations of a fish. And a man in the germ cannot be distinguished from any other mammal. Here, the Darwinist drops his glass and jumps at the conclusion that all creations, even vegetables, are consanguine brothers. His microscope has failed him. And he's forgotten the ardent astronomer who saw strange quadrupeds in the moon until he discovered the mouse nest in the telescope. The apparently similar cells are different. The outcome proves it. Now, we remember that the, one of the later editions of The Origin of the Species prominently features Haeckel's embryonic research, research that was later proven to be a complete hoax. But, uh, but embryology became one of the key arguments for Darwinism, the similarity in some of these organisms and uh, phylogeny, ontogeny, recapitulates phylogeny. This idea of our evolutionary ancestry is uh, reenacted as an embryo develops uh, from a tiny little single uh, cell to a, a full born um, baby that is developed. And of course, he's being, this is being rejected uh, by this paper. Now, we have to understand, we're talking about the early 1900s, evolution was still fairly controversial in America, not as yet associated with naturalism uh, the way it is today. Uh, this idea that only natural explanations can be allowed. It wasn't associated with atheism. And so we see that there has been a change after the Scopes monkey trials and some of these things. And uh, so this whole thing has developed today to be far less Christian even than it was in those days. Number two, the authors adhere to a very literal interpretation of Genesis. The scriptures are authoritative. That is very clear as one reads these articles. Number three, the age of the earth issue had not been fully worked out, hadn't been worked through. There were some proponents of gap theory. Some of my great heroes in the faith, people like C.I. Schofield, uh, people like Dr. Bob Jones Sr. were gap theorists. And uh, I want to be very gracious here. I want to um, not be judgmental or arrogant or really um, hypercritical. I want us to stand for biblical truth, and I want this to be something where we're wise and we're discriminating. We're able to see where it is that folks depart from biblical Christianity into apostasy and jeopardize the teaching of the gospel that's so precious for the saving of souls. We need to stand for historic Christianity or it'll be lost. And with it, the ability for folks to be saved and come to understand the true Jesus Christ and have assurance of salvation. But at the same time, we have to understand there's some areas where good Christians, folks that are within the true church, might have disagreements. For example, there were people at the original gathering that uh, put together these fundamentals and organized them into an original volume, which was then funded to send to um, different Christian leaders all over the world, missionaries and pastors and evangelists, and uh, people became, began to identify with them and became known as fundamentalists. Uh, today, uh, it would be similar to conservative evangelicals, and, 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 and still many people today would identify as fundamentalists. Um, but again, I want to be gracious because there were people then that believed in the gap theory. Uh, some of these original authors were not completely settled on the length of a day in Genesis chapter one, James Orr in particular. Uh, and so there are things that are fundamentals and there are things that are important truths that we hold. Let me give you an example. I am a Baptist. I attend a Baptist church. Now I, I was uh, a Lutheran. I was sprinkled a Lutheran as a young boy. My parents came from Germany, my grandparents. And, um, we, I grew up, you know, being sprinkled. Uh, but after having studied the matter out by conviction, I am a Baptist. 
Now, I have some wonderful friends that are Presbyterians, and, and they would disagree with me on the method of baptism. That's not a fundamental of the faith. It's important to me, and I would you know, have a strong discussion with you about it. But it's not a fundamental. It's not an essential to the gospel. You don't lose historic Christianity if you sprinkle verses if you baptize. And the same would go with something like the age of the earth. Now, some of these folks would be gap theorists. They would hold to the earth being older. And we'll talk more about the gap theory. But again, this isn't a fundamental of the faith. That There isn't a verse you could point to and say, the gospel hinges on the earth being X number of thousands of years old. I have some strong feelings about that. As a creation speaker, I travel around the country, I travel around the world speaking on the age of the earth, speaking on um, some of the wonderful evidences scientifically that the earth is young. I believe strongly that it fits well within our understanding of the genealogies, a straightforward understanding of some of the words of Jesus. So it's something I hold to very firmly, but it's not a fundamental of the faith. And so that's uh, something that we have to be gracious about. And, and I hope that that's the spirit that you'll understand from me today. Now, I think it's important for us to understand some things that are not negotiable. And this is where I wanna talk about a historical Adam. So where is it that we would say, okay, someone has now gone from just maybe having a different interpretation to actually coming off the reservation. And, and this matter of a historical Adam is, is a really important matter. It's something that's been uh, an issue since the enlightenment, the historicity of Adam was questioned. Today, an increasing number of evangelical scholars are inclined to deny Adam's historicity, while others would even say it's an open question or that it's not an important issue. Uh, and I, I want to give you some examples. And I don't want to give you examples, again, to try to uh, cast stones at people or to be judgmental of people. But you under, need to understand who takes what positions. You're going to hear people out there. Uh, you're going to see people on various broadcasts. You're going to read books by people. Um, perhaps you'll come across uh, some shows uh, where people are, are taking certain positions. So I want to give you some of the current thinking. Here is Alistair McGrath, who's a theology professor. Quote, I understand why people see Adam as a historical figure, but it makes more sense to see Adam and Eve as stereotypical figures who represent human potential as created by God, but also with the capacity to go wrong. So Professor McGrath is saying, you want to believe in historical Adam, okay, but I, I don't know that that's essential. I wouldn't stand for that. I wouldn't make that a big issue, okay? Now, I don't know where Brother McGrath is on, on other issues. Uh, I'm not saying he's not a Christian. As Christians, we're to be known for our love. But at the same time, we need to be willing to take a stand on departures from historic Christianity. And where I would draw the line is where somebody denies a historical Adam. That's the point where not only do we affect um, some minor interpretation of Genesis 1, but we're actually doubting the very authority of God's word not only in Genesis chapter one and two, but even also over in the sayings of Jesus in the gospels and really the teachings of Paul in Romans and elsewhere. Here's Peter ends with BioLogos. Now BioLogos is the number one organization that propounds theistic evolution. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along, but a large organization and uh, they take a theistic evolutionary position. And uh, N says in his article, The Evolution of Adam, a historical Adam has been the dominant Christian view for 2,000 years. We must add, however, the general consensus was formed before the advent of evolutionary theory. Evolution demands that the special creation of the first Adam, as described in the Bible, is not literally historical. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with evolution demanding anything of historic Christianity. Uh, I think it's fine to have some scholarship brought in, people that understand Hebrews, people that understand Hebrew, people that have some uh, good understanding of the, the church fathers and uh, people that with much prayer and research have struggled through some issues that are maybe difficult to understand in God's word and have become specialists and uh, we can glean insight from that. But to have uh, secular biologists, oftentimes atheists come and make demands of our understanding of Genesis is absolutely inappropriate. So I would completely disagree with Peter Enns. Here is Dennis Lamoureux, St. Joseph's College, and uh, Professor uh, Dennis Lamoureux says, first, Adam never existed. 
Second, Adam never actually sinned because he never existed. Consequently, sin did not enter the world on account of Adam. Third, Adam was never judged by God to suffer and die. Now, we're seeing a bit of a progression from somebody who was a bit skeptical about Adam and Eve to someone who's outright denying a literal Adam and Eve. And this is a major problem. We have departed from historic Christianity. We've departed from those foundational truths that really lay the basis for the gospel and all the rest of the Bible. I can't not improve on what D. Martin Lloyd-Jones says about this. I just love this man. I love his response. And I'm going to quote him here. We must assert that we believe in the being of one first man called Adam and one first woman called Eve. Now, someone may ask, why do you care about this? Is this essential to your doctrine of salvation? If we say we believe the Bible to be the word of God, we must say that about the whole of the Bible. And when the Bible presents itself to us as history, we must accept it as history. Well said D. Martin Lloyd-Jones. So creation is the fundamental building block of the Bible. And I would say creationism absolutely is a fundamental of the faith. And Psalm 11.3 says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The results of knocking out foundations like creation are devastating to the building of gospel and historic Christian understandings. Now let's talk about some popular interpretations of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. I'm going to mention a few here. I'll start off with the most conservative and most liberal positions and then move further out into uh, less conservative, more progressive, and non-literal interpretations. Uh, young Earth creationism is my personal persuasion. I have a number of presentations on that, so I'm not going to belabor that in this session. Um, but that is obviously one of the popular interpretations of Genesis 1 that's out there. Number two, the gap theory. We'll talk about that. Number three, the framework hypothesis. That may be one that's less familiar, um, but it is a is one of the theories that's popular out there. Number four, progressive creation theory, or sometimes called the day-age interpretation. Number five, theistic evolution. And we'll spend some time on that one, which is very popular even in a lot of seminaries today. Well, let's talk about the gap theory. The gap theory is this idea that between Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, there's a gap, maybe uh, some long period, maybe even billions of years. Uh, Genesis 1, 1 describes an original creation by God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, perhaps that's a, a beautiful creation where the dinosaurs roamed and uh, there was no man, Adam, yet. There was no Garden of Eden yet, um, but there was an original creation. And then Satan rebelled against God and he and his demonic horde were thrown out of heaven. They were cast to the earth. And in the process of this judgment and, and satanic revolt, the earth is destroyed. And you end up with fossils and you end up with all these rock layers. And that's where the dinosaur fossils and all these, these fossils came from. And then Genesis chapter 1-2 says the earth was without form and void. They would say it became without form and void because of Satan's fall. And then the gap theorists would propose that the rest of Genesis chapter 1 is God's recreating of the earth and creating a place, uh, a garden of Eden for man to dwell and then creating Adam and Eve there. Now, uh, the gap theorists um, are not being unbiblical. The gap theorists are not saying that things that are, uh, they're not going off the reservation as far as a literal understanding of Genesis. By and large, they would hold to a literal Adam. They would hold to biblical authority. They're just reading into these verses something that I, I wouldn't see there. It wouldn't naturally come with the flow of it. Uh, they're getting that from modern science and wanting to believe in these you know, millions or billions of years. And so they're, they're projecting this into scripture. Now, there's some problems with the gap theory. Uh, number one, the Bible says there's no death or fossils, which are dead things, before Adam. Uh, Romans 5.12 is very clear. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. 
Before Adam's sins, there is no death. Well, what are fossils? They're dead things, things that died, oftentimes very violently, uh, showing uh, carnivory and showing diseases and showing um, uh, catastrophes of some kind where things are suffocating and, and getting drowned and stuff. So uh, this is, is ruled out by Romans 5.12. Uh, before that, there just wasn't. Uh, you know, all of creation is groaning today because of man's sin and God's judgment, not just on the world of men, but on all creation, thorns and thistles. And, and all this carnivory was impacted because of man's sin. And so no death or fossils before Adam's sin. Number two, Satan did not fall before the Garden of Eden was created. We read in Job chapter 38, verses 4 and 7, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou wast understanding. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Notice all the sons of God. This is talking about angels. Morning stars, sons of God. These are biblical terms for the angelic host. And so before some of the sons of God became demonic, wicked sons of God and followed Satan, God had laid the foundations of the earth. So Satan fell after Eden was created. This means there was no sin in existence, no temptation had taken place, no judgment had been rendered. Yet gap theorists believe that the fall of Satan and his judgment of being cast to the earth is what destroyed the original creation and that this necessitated a recreation, including the Garden of Eden and Adam. Ezekiel 28 is pretty clear about Satan. It says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou was perfect, perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. And so he had been in Eden still in a perfect state. And it wasn't until afterwards, sometime after the creation of the garden of Eden and sometime before he came and tempted Eve, Satan and his demonic forces disobeyed God rebelled against God, but we're never told that their fall uh, affected the earth in any way, that it would cause any destruction or mayhem on the earth, um, just there having rebelled. Later on, of course, Satan causes temptation and causes mayhem that way. So Satan did not fall before Eden. Number three, uh, the gap theorists would make a big deal about this idea that there is in the King James Version, the word replenish. The uh, animals are told to go out and replenish the earth in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. And they'll say, well, that means because there was an original earth, it was destroyed, and their job was to go and replenish it. But it did not mean refill. That word replenish did not mean refill until 1650. Before that, it just meant to fill the earth. And the Hebrew word, male, actually means just to fill the earth, just procreate and, and go from being an original created population that God made to literally expanding and filling the earth with creatures. Now, a prominent uh, evangelical author that would hold to the gap theory today would be John Salehammer. And he says, Genesis 1-1 refers to the creation of the entire functioning universe, including the sun, moon, and stars in the heavens, and the plants and animals on earth. Genesis 1, 2 and onwards describes God preparing a land for man and women to inhabit. The same land promised to Abraham and his descendants, the same land given to the Israelites after their wandering in the desert. So he would be a proponent in this book, Genesis Unbound of the Gap Theory. Now I want to talk about the framework hypothesis. Uh, and these folks uh, are somewhere in between. I wouldn't say that you know, all of them have a left biblical authority. I would say they, by and large, would hold to a literal atom, but they believe God organized things in a symmetry of triads that reflects a non-chronological literary message. Uh, they would say the culmination of creation is this continuous seventh day, indicating that others are non-literal days as well. What, what do they mean by that? Well, on each of the days, it says there's an evening and a morning, except on the seventh day. It doesn't say that. And so they would hold... God rested the seventh day, but then God continued to rest. He didn't, you know, reinitiate his creation acts. So the seventh day is just continued ad infinitum. And they would say, okay, so if the seventh day is really a continuing day and not just a 24-hour day, then maybe the other days are non-literal as well. They're just maybe a period of time. And the other thing they point to is that Genesis 1 has this kind of structural sort of a framework sort of a thing. 
Uh, they say, for example, on day one, God works with light, and there's that parallel on day four where God works with the sun, moon, and stars, the luminaries. Uh, day two, God uh, works with the sky and sea, and day five, we see God working with the sea creatures and the wing creatures, the flying creatures. Day three, God works with the dry land and brings about the vegetation, and day six, God works with the land animals and man. And so they point to some of these parallels and say, and it just seems a little bit kind of poetic almost, and we think it's non-literal. Uh, and so then, of course, talk about the day seven, this, this rest. Now, I have some disagreements here. Um, number one, God doesn't really create the sky and the sea on day two. Uh, the sea is there. God makes the heavens and the earth. So there's, there's, a, there's a sky, uh, third heaven anyway. Um, but God's working with the atmosphere on day two. God takes the waters and separates the waters that are under the atmosphere from the waters above the atmosphere. Um, it doesn't really make the sky and the sea. Uh, day three, we have dry land and vegetation. I'm not sure how vegetation equates with man there. Um, I don't see it. Um, so at best, maybe you've got kind of an interesting little bit of parallels of threes here, or triads, but it's nothing that's carrying any major significant message or anything that the Bible outright explicitly tells us. Also, this idea of God resting the seventh day. Well, yeah, God rests for a 24-hour day, but then it says that God blessed the Sabbath day and he hallowed it. And, and if it wasn't a 24-hour period, how does God bless a particular day, which then would become a pattern for us to rest on a day, not some indefinite period? Uh, so I just don't see it. I, I don't see this, um, this argument. It just doesn't, doesn't carry water to me. Uh, the person who pioneered this framework hypothesis is Meredith Klein, um, Presbyterian Old Testament scholar and seminary professor, and he wrote a book um, because it had not rained. And he makes a big deal about the fact that Genesis 2, 5 says it had not rained on the earth. And he says that really is highlighting the fact that God is working with natural laws and making a big deal about the rain. Um, again, I just, I don't see how that can mean that natural processes were holding sway. You got all kinds of supernatural things happening. Um, by anybody's reading of Genesis chapter one and two. You've got birds and, and sea creatures just popping into existence out of the ocean. You've got land animals and plants just kind of popping in existence out of the dirt. You've got God forming man out of the dust of the ground and, and, and kind of breathing into his nostrils the breath of life, forming Eve out of a rib. I mean, there's all kinds of supernatural activity that's going on, and it is no indication that it's just uh, all supposed to be viewed as natural processes. So some of the other problems with the framework hypothesis, it's uh, trying to tell us that it's not literal history, um, it's stylistic. Um, Genesis 1 and 2 really matches the rest of the book. It's not different. It's not like you can say, okay, uh, Genesis 1 to 2 is poetic. It's using similes. You read words like like and as. And um, for example, think about parables. Jesus would introduce a parable by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that travels into a far country and he tells a story. You don't read words like, like, <laughs> and metaphors and, and as and similes. And we understand these literary devices. They're all through the Psalms. They're through the parables. We don't see them in Genesis chapter one and two. And you say, well, I, I think Genesis one and two are poetic and, and I, I just don't hold that they're literal history. Well, then what about Genesis 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9? Most of the people that would say Genesis 1 and 2 aren't history, they'd also hold it for uh, the, uh, these other chapters because they'd say, well, we don't want to believe in a literal universal flood, a worldwide flood. And so, uh, well, then what about Abraham? What about the table of nations? What about chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14? At what point does Genesis become literal history? Well, most folks want to believe that Abraham existed and Isaac and Jacob, and there was the children of Israel, and they were in the land of Egypt, and there was a real exodus. But there really is no difference in the language. The language of Genesis 1 and 2 is the same. It's the same historical narrative style as the rest of the book of Genesis. Now, Genesis 2 reviews the creation. It discusses the hydrological cycle and proceeds to detail God's day six work in making the Garden of Eden and the creation of Adam and Eve. So we have some differences between Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two. 
And some of the differences involve the fact that Genesis chapter one is chronological, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Genesis chapter two is summary. It kind of reviews, overviews some of the work that God did in Genesis and creation and uh, in Genesis one and creation. And then it kind of discusses some of the specifics of the hydrological cycle, this misting that's going on. And also it discusses some of the specifics of God's creation of Adam and Eve. And uh, so th there's differences. And, and God talks about his making this garden and bringing certain creatures up out of the garden for Adam to name right on the spot. Uh, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's a contradiction. It just is one is chronology, the other is summary and giving some more specifics. Number three, while the framework hypothesis does not commit to an old earth, proponents clearly have that in view. As such, it faces the same challenges as the day age theory. And so I'm going to not introduce those problems right now, but what I will do is I will cover some of those problems as we go through the day age theory. So each day, the day age theorists would say, each day is really a long period of time. It's an age. And it's that Hebrew word yom. The Hebrew word yom or day, they would say is a long eon of maybe millions or maybe billions of years. So day one where God makes the light could really be you know, several billion years. Day two is maybe, you know, several hundred million years. And we can't pin these down to 24 hour days. We need to let them be long periods of time. And that's how they would accommodate an old earth in Genesis chapter one. Now the day age theorists, um, some of them kind of get off the reservation of biblical authority. Uh, some of them perhaps maybe haven't thought this through. And so I try to be gracious with people uh, in explaining to them the problems with day age theory. But some of these folks have just outright denied biblical authority and they are unwilling just to believe the, the the literal truth of the bible and that's a problem it's a problem of authority in their life and really doubting god's word which is the original temptation of what a satan did with eve very dangerous and so i will concede that there are places in the bible where it talks about a day as being a long period of time but the context makes it very clear. Like for example, it talks about the day of Jacob's trouble. And uh, we talk about that still sometimes. Somebody's misbehaving, we're like, you got your day coming. And it may not be a literal day, but we're just saying that you're gonna have some bad stuff happen at some point because of it. Uh, but when the Bible speaks so clearly, day one, day two, day three, and especially when the Bible talks about there being an evening and a morning, it's talking about a 24 hour day. So problems with the day age theory. Number one, God made Adam and Eve in the beginning. Now, Jesus is really clear about this. When he's asked about divorce in Mark 10, 6, he says this, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And so follow me for this, just a minute. Let's just say the evolutionists are correct in their understanding of the history of our universe. Well, then you're gonna go way back and you're gonna say that the universe is whatever, say 15 billion years old, just to round it up. And then you've got the earth come into existence maybe 4.5 billion years ago, somewhere in there. Eventually this molten glob becomes cool enough that we get liquid water and a few billion years ago maybe or so you've got water uh, generating life. Uh, so the first life may be simple cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, is maybe four billion years ago. And so for million, hundreds of millions of years, you have just simple life. And then about 600 million years ago, you get the first sophisticated life forms in the Cambrian explosion. And this would give you things like uh, the fish that eventually will crawl up on land and be amphibians and will turn into reptiles. And those reptiles will rule the earth for you know 200 million years ago to about 60 million years ago when the dinosaurs go extinct. And then finally about 3 million years ago, you have the first ape-like humans. So you've got literally a gap of going all the way back 15 billion years to about 3 million years ago, and humans don't show up till almost the very end. So how can God say, Jesus say, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female? They're almost clear to the end. So either Jesus doesn't know, which makes no sense because he's the creator, or they were created, Adam and Eve, right back in the beginning when God made everything else. So God made Adam and Eve in the beginning. Number two, the plants wouldn't survive millions of years without insects to pollinate them. 
If you're going to say that uh, these, these plants come up out of the ground on day three, and yet you don't, and then maybe it goes for millions of years before you get the sun, moon, and stars, and uh, that's, that's a bit of a problem. But then even more for all these insects uh, to you know, pollinate them, that's a problem. And then number three, God uses this specific language, evening and morning, or the first day. Uh, and uh, the, the first day, the second day, it's very specific language. Over and over again, we see this refrain mentioned six times in the evening and the morning were the first day, the second day, the third day, and so forth. And then we see the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, for in six days, the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is and rested the seventh day. And so this is used as a pattern for us that we are to work for six days, rest the seventh day, and uh, these are literal days that are being discussed there. Now here's Hugh Ross, and he would, he's an author, and he would be a prominent uh, a proponent of the day-age theory. He called himself a progressive creationist. He says, not everyone has been exposed to the 66 books of the Bible, but everyone on planet Earth has been exposed to the 67th book. You might scratch your head and say, whoa, there's a 67th book of the Bible? The book that God has written upon the heavens for everyone to read. And the Bible tells us it's impossible for God to lie. So when astronomers tell us their measurements of time, it's part of the truth that God has revealed to us, part of the word of God. Okay, we're supposed to change our understanding of the Bible? This is supposed to be the 66th book of the Bible uh, saying one thing, but the 67th book of the Bible saying another thing? And, and, and we're supposed to put this on the par with biblical authority? That's, that's a huge problem. Now let's talk about theistic evolution. Now theistic evolution says God guides the process of evolution from behind the scenes. Big bang, life from non-life, man from an animal, and gradual evolution through mutation is God's chosen mechanism. Let's say the purpose of the creation account is to convey moral, not scientific truth. Now look, I agree that the Bible talks about things that are moral truth, uh, and that's a big part of what's happening in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. But the Bible is God's word. There's only one person there to observe it, and that's God. Nothing more scientific than personal observation. And there's only one person to observe it, and he told us what he did. And he told it to us very specifically and very carefully. And so when we don't believe it, it becomes an issue of doubting God's authority. So while the Bible is not a book on history and science specifically, when it speaks to history, it's accurate. When it speaks to science, even though it's not a science textbook, it's accurate. Why? Because it's God's word. It is authoritative. It's inspired. It is um, reliable. It is God's communication to us. And if we can't trust it in Genesis chapter 1, how do we trust it in John chapter 3? And yet the theistic evolutionists would say, well, we can just learn some rough biblical or some rough moral ideas from there. Here's Bruce Waltke, and he's an evangelical scholar, and he says, if the data is overwhelmingly in favor of evolution, to deny that reality would make us a cult, some odd group that's not really interacting with the world. And rightly so, because we're not using our gifts and trusting God's providence that brought us to this point of our awareness. So he's saying, I don't know who decides that the data is overwhelming at, the, at some point, but if he's saying that the data is overwhelming and we don't go with the data, we become a cult. Now, that has never been understood by the, the Christian, uh, historic Christianity as what makes up a cult. A cult is a group that deviates from the clear teaching of God's word on some of the key fundamentals, some of the key gospel central teachings. They kind of swerve off after some uh, popular uh, prophet or some uh, false book that is supposed to be on par with the Bible. And they, and they deviate from historic Christianity on central core fundamentals, like creation. But to not adhere to the latest understanding from the scientific community doesn't make us a cult. I mean, at worst, maybe we're, we're ill-informed scientifically. Um, but this is just so wrong, and this is published in Christianity Today in 2011. These folks take science, and they put it in a place of authority and preeminence over God's word. And literally, they're, they're shoving this old earth thinking, this Pleistocene, Pleistocene, all these different geological ages, they're jamming them into God's word. 
and the modern evolutionist understanding of these geological layers are being forced into God's word. Now I say again, either the Bible is literally true or it's untrustworthy. Over and over again, we see God saw it was good. Multiple times, like a refrain, this point comes through, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's very good. Now, there's nothing good about the evolutionary understanding of origins. Uh, Darwin said in his book, thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of higher animals directly follows. What's he saying? He's saying through diseases, through mutations, through death, through carnivory, we get these beautiful animals. Natural selection uses this to create things. And on the front cover of his book, at least uh, one of these books, the, the Penguin Classic volume, he has this Mosasaurus chopping off the neck of a plesiosaurus and the blood squirting out. And is that the way the God of the Bible creates things through a long, torturous process of trial and error, evolution, mutation, struggle for existence, disease and death? When God says it's good and when it's very good, is, is that what he's looking at and calling good? No, I don't think God's good creation is sitting on top of millions of years of death. Words mean things. Uh, what, what about when God talks about heaven being good and we believe it to be good, very good, and when we get there someday, what if we find out it's a place of struggles and death and suffering and, and pain and people living with diseases? I would trust that we would, we would be horrified that that would be ever called good. And, and so words mean things, and, and God means things when he says things. How literally should we take Genesis? Well, this is a topic that's been going all the way back to St. Augustine. Um, should we view this very literally? Should we view it you know, somewhat literally? Conservative evangelicals and fundamentalists traditionally take a passage literally, unless there's a clear indication in the text not to. Uh, when we communicate amongst ourselves, we can understand when we're using literary devices and metaphors. We can understand when things are non-literal, and that's the way it is with Genesis. It's well-written, it's written under the inspiration of God, and we can understand that it's meant to be taken literally. And the main reason for the Old Earth interpretation is to appear sophisticated and respectable within greater academia. Now here's Tim Keller, and I love Tim Keller. I've read some of his books and enjoyed them very much. I have some relatives that attend his church, um, Redeemer Church there in, in New York. And uh, I appreciate uh, what he's done, but I disagree with him with regards to his association with BioLogos and his espousing certain theistic evolutionary positions. Now, I believe Tim would hold to a literal atom still, and that he would disagree with some of the, his friends in BioLogos, but I wouldn't invite Tim Keller to come speak for a group on Genesis chapter one and two. I, I wouldn't recommend to a pastor to have him come in and speak on Genesis 1 and 2, because he's, he's, he's just clearly uh, wrong on this, his understanding there. He says the author in Genesis 1 did not want to be taken literally. Compare the order of creative acts in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 1 shows light before the sun and vegetation created before the atmosphere existed. Genesis 2 presents a more natural order, and Genesis 1 is exalted poetic description. Well, we've talked about this. There's nothing in the language. Hebrew scholars will tell you there's nothing in the language of Genesis chapter 1 or 2 that would indicate its exalted poetic description. It's straightforward narrative. It's history that's meant to be taken literally. And in fact, Genesis chapter 1 is very chronological. Uh, he's got it exactly wrong. Genesis 1 talks about day 1, day 2, day 3, day, and the evening in the morning, the evening in the morning, the evening in the morning. Genesis chapter two is the one that's summarizing and it's talking, it's kind of jumping around non chronologically and filling in some details of God's uh, work from Genesis chapter one. Now here's Francis Collins and Francis Collins is, uh, is not a theologian, but he's a brilliant scientist. He headed up the human genome project for the United States government and he was the founder of BioLogos and BioLogos has become very active in pressing and pushing the cause of theistic evolution and creation circles and really opposing uh, young earth creationism. And I got to go uh, in 2007 and hear Francis Collins, or Dr. Collins spoke at Harvard University and he spoke on theistic evolution. And he made the statement, God guided the process of evolution until an ape capable of a soul came along. Then God put a spirit into him and called him Adam. So he's saying, you know, evolution would tell us there was a population really of ape-like creatures. And eventually one of them got advanced enough that God could 
uh, put a, a spirit into him and breathe into him this, this breath of life and he could become Adam. Now, uh, theistic evolution directly contradicts the Bible. Uh, it says in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. There's no ape-like creatures. There's no uh, bunch of interbreeding populations. Uh, we know Adam did not have any earthly parents, according to the genealogies in Luke 3. So my question, if I had the opportunity of an audience with Dr. Collins, would be, can't we just read and understand the Bible? Why do we have to go to modern secular biologists to learn what Genesis 1 means? Why would God not just tell us the simple truth? How could all the generations before modern science understand their Bible? This makes no sense whatsoever. And so uh, this theistic evolution is not only contrary to scripture and uh, modern uh, thought is very much opposed to just pure logic at this point. Here's Kenton Sparks, and he's with BioLogos, and he takes this to its natural conclusion. He says, in fact, theistic evolutionists have admitted Jesus affirmed recent creation, the literal reading of Genesis, and the historicity of Adam and Eve. But they claim that Jesus, as a human, operated within his finite, human, scientific, and historical horizon. What does Kenton Sparks mean by this? He says, if Jesus, as a finite human being, erred from time to time, there's no reason at all to suppose that Moses, Paul, John, wrote scripture without error. So what's happened here now? What's happened is the folks at BioLogos, the theistic evolutionists, went from questioning the, under, the literal understanding of Genesis in these days and wanting to believe in an old earth, to then saying, well, we agree that Jesus really does affirm a recent creation. So I guess not only can we not believe in the literal understanding of Genesis, but even Jesus, when he took to a literal understanding of it, he was an error. He's a product of his time. He understood the science of his day. Here he's trained in the synagogues. And, and so as a young boy of the you know, first century AD, I mean, what can you expect? He just doesn't understand science. He just doesn't understand history like we do now. So he, he's making all these mistakes in his understanding of Genesis. Now, not only have we thrown out the authority of God's word, we've thrown out the deity of Jesus Christ. We've thrown out his um, inerrancy. We, we've thrown out the fact that he's creator. We've thrown out the fact that he has uh, all knowledge, his omniscience. And, and basically we have trashed historic Christianity. That's where theistic evolution leads. Now here's Daniel Harlow at Calvin College. And Professor Harlow says, for Christianity to remain intellectually credible and culturally relevant, it must be willing to revise and thereby enrich its formulation of classic doctrines if the secure findings of science call for revision. I say again, who decides what the secure findings of science are? I mean, science has changed dramatically in just the last 100 years. So what was thought to be secure maybe 100 or 200 years ago has dramatically changed. So what's to think it's not going to change again in another 100 years? And everything that we understand about Christianity is out the window, maybe, potentially. There is no firm foundation. There is no rock to stand on. There is no biblical authority. There's no hope for a sure knowledge of eternal life or life beyond the grave. There's no knowledge that for sure our sins are forgiven, that Jesus is the son of God. Everything is completely speculative. Everything is completely um, uh, susceptible to being thrown out because of secure findings of science that might come down the road. So I say again, I believe God made the earth in six literal days, just like he said. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. I want to conclude this point by a quote from Martin Luther on creation. Now, Martin Luther was not in his day fighting with theistic evolutionists. Charles Darwin hadn't come along yet. But he was having a disagreement with people that thought it was inelegant for God to create the earth over six literal days. They thought it would be far more elegant for God to create the earth in a snap, in an instant, to just create everything. Why would God need to take multiple days to do it? And we understand God's, you know, decided to do things in, in, in a slow process over days uh, to set a pattern for us. And because he 
uh, in his infinite wisdom, decided that would be a wise and wonderful way to do it. And so Martin Luther says, when Moses writes that God created the heaven and the earth and whatever's in them in six days, then let this period continue to have been six days. You do not venture to devise any comment according to which six days were one day. But if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. For you're to deal with scripture in such a way that you're to bear in mind that God himself says what is written. But since God is speaking, it's not fitting for you to wantonly turn his word in the direction you wish to go. Sage words for these that hold to these various popular interpretations of Genesis chapters 1 and 2 today. Well, I want to conclude briefly with point number three, essential creationism tenets. So if we were to hold that creationism is a fundamental of faith, what do we mean by that? What are the key points that we would say are really essential creation tenets? Number one, God made the universe ex nihilo, Hebrews 11, verse 3. God made the earth from nothing. It didn't come from some previous form. It didn't come from some condensation of the vapor cloud, which then exploded in a big bang, and eventually this would coalesce into the earth. No, God made the universe ex nihilo. Number two, God created all that lives on the earth in six days, Exodus 20, 11. Number three, man was created separately from animals. There's a literal Adam with a soul, Genesis 2, 7. Number four, God made the original earth perfect, and it was then cursed as a result of sin, Genesis chapter 3. And finally, a global flood during Noah's day destroyed all land animals as a judgment, Genesis 7, 22. We could give lots of other verses. Of course, Hebrews talks about uh, some of these things. Peter talks about the global flood. Jesus discusses creation. Uh, Paul discusses it in Romans. So there's lots of other verses, but these are just some plain verses, plain teachings on these core five points. Now you might say, well, young earth creationism, what about the age of the earth? Don't you guys believe that the earth is young? Isn't that a core component of creationism? Biblically, it's not at the same explicit level of clarity. I can't point you to one verse that says, thou shalt believe the earth is 6,000 years old. I believe that. I think it comes straight out of an understanding of the, um, the genealogies. I think it fits. I think there's lots of good evidence for it. But a young earth plainly follows from harmonizing of scriptures, and it's not essential to the gospel. Again, I take you back to those fundamentals they were people that believed in a gap theory. Uh, they're people that questioned uh, that they were literal 24-hour days. And these are the folks that wrote the fundamentals, godly men. Uh, and so it's, they were not unanimous at the time of the fundamentals. So there needs to be some allowance for non-scientists who do believe the Genesis account, but just haven't studied out the matter in detail. Nearly all fundamentalists adhere to a young earth today, and most conservative evangelicals do as well. We have a great deal more evidence for a young earth than an old earth. And I have other sessions that deal with that, and I'm not going to uh, deal with that at this point. Well, that concludes our presentation on, is creationism a fundamental of the faith? I hope it's been encouraging to you and has strengthened your faith in the literal understanding of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. If you have questions or you'd like more information, I'd invite you to come out to genesispark.com you can enroll in our monthly newsletter, or you could drop us a note by touching contact. Love to hear from you. If there's something we can clarify, or perhaps you'd give us some feedback at genesispark.com. God bless you.